Well, in the previous couple of, couple of chapters of Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, God has unfolded his perfect pattern for the kingdom. It was the way things should be. And it was the way things were for a time. But today, in the passage, we hear something in the music that's not quite right. There's something new in the garden. And of course, it's the snake, isn't it? And it's there to attack God's people, God's kingdom. Now, it's not there because God's made a mistake. It's there so that the guardians of the garden, Adam and Eve, can confront it. They've been given the job to rule over all the earth, including that snake. So how is it going to turn out? Well, let's find out, shall we? Let's read from Genesis chapter 3. You find that on page 4, I imagine. 2, all right. It's my page 4. All right. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said you must not eat of it or touch it or you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes opened, and they knew they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. Then he asked, Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man replied, The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree, and I ate. So the Lord God asked the woman, What is this that you've done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And he said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children with painful effort. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. And he said to the man, Because you have listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return to dust. The man named his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made clothing from skin for the man and his wife, and he clothed them. The Lord God said, Since the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out, take from the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. And so the Lord God sent him away from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove the men out and stationed the cherubim and the flaming, whirling sword east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. So today, we've witnessed this first attack against God's kingdom right in the garden itself. On the one side, there's the snake or the serpent. Now what do we know about that? Well, verse 3. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And we can tell from what he says later that he's God's enemy. Now, of course, snakes don't usually talk, but we learn later that the one talking was actually Satan or the devil. He was part of God's creation 
an angel of some kind we learn, who said no to God's rule. And the other side, we have the humans. And God has said to them last week, you're in charge of every creature that moves on the earth. And that includes that snake. So we have God's enemy versus God's second in charge. Well, it doesn't seem like a fair fight, does it? God's given Adam and Eve dominion and power over the whole of creation. But it's not a question of power. It all comes down to this. Who will the humans listen to and obey? God or his enemy? That's where the fight is won, the lost, and the snake knows it. And that's where he strikes. The snake knows that God rules by his word. Now, what was that word again? You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. For on the day you eat of it, you will certainly die. But if the snake can make the word of God sound bad to God's people, he's won the battle. So he begins with something that sounds like the truth. Continuing there in verse 1. Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? It's like he's saying, did God really make all those beautiful trees and then say you can't eat their fruit? No one could be that cruel. See, the snake knows, of course, that God's barred them from only one tree in the garden and the rest is theirs to enjoy. But you can see what he's doing. He wants to make God look stingy and mean. Oh, sure. But it's not a good rule, is it, Eve? It stops you doing good things. Eve, well, Eve, maybe it's good for God that he said, but that it's certainly not good for you. And then the snake takes another angle. God isn't just stingy. He's jealous as well. Jealous of you, Eve, of what you'd become if you made your own rules. Obey your own word. You don't need God. You don't have to submit to his rule, to his kingdom. How does the snake put it? No. No, you'll not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Eve, you're a threat to God. That's why he's got to lie, just to keep you under his thumb. If he let you eat from the tree, you'd be like him. Now, if God said something bad had happened to you, but it would only be bad for him, it would be good for you. Eve, God's rule is not good for you. So that's the lie. So kids, what did that snake want Adam and Eve to believe? This is how you would fill in those blanks if you haven't got them. We have that next slide up there. Thanks, Emily. The snake wanted Adam and Eve to believe God's rule is not good for you. That's the snake's lie, isn't it? And they believe it. They swear it completely. And you and I would have done no better. And so in verse 6, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. And so she took some of its fruit and ate it and, and also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. So kids, we're at point two now, rebellion. And the question on your sheet, you can just leave that, up, that one up there, Emily, thanks. The question on your sheet, after they believe the snake's lie, what do Adam and Eve say to themselves? See if you can hear the answer. See, friends not, much, friends, not much has changed since that moment in time. The lie remains the same, and sadly, we believe it just as easily, don't we? So what's our way of, be, of uh, describing sin here been lately? Hey, God, I'm God, and you're not. I will break you rule over me. And that's just what Adam and Eve do, don't they? They say to themselves, we will break away from God's rule. <laughs> but Eve... Eve, Eve, you believe God's stingy and yet he's given you an enormous garden to delight in. And Adam, you really believe God is jealous 
after he's made both you and your wife in his own image and he's made you in charge of his whole creation. God is not stingy or jealous. Why on earth would you want to break away from his rule? There's a big clue for you, kids. Adam and Eve say to themselves, that next slide, thanks, Emily. I will, or was it we? We will break away from God's rule. They say, I want to rule my own kingdom. We all do this, don't we? We want our own kingdom. We all say, hey, God, I'm God and you're not. We're sinners by nature. And it's hard to see it in ourselves, isn't it, that that's our nature? Uh, when we read that passage, uh, thanks, Penny, from uh, Romans 3, about the state of the human heart, did you find yourself asking, is that really talking about me? Am I really that bad? Surely that's other people, the, the, the people out there. Surely they're the ones who have turned away and become worthless. They're the ones, they're the, the no one who does good. But friends, we show it with every complaint against God or ourselves or others, every word of gossip, every extended sideways look, every jealous thought, they all say, I'm God and you're not. See, we say, God, you say lying's not good for me. But if, my, if lying stops my mum punishing me because she doesn't know what I did, then lying must be good for me. And God, my greed means that I get the things I want. How can that not be good for me? God, I treasure my lust and my envy and my anger and my pride. But you say they're not good. Well, God, your rule takes away the delights of my heart. Your rule stops me fulfilling my potential. But I'm not God and you're not, so I will break away from your rule, just like our ancestors. This is what we do by nature. But if you don't really think that's you or me that I'm describing, do you think you would have fared any better in the garden? No, you wouldn't have. You would have sinned in just the same way as Adam and Eve. And then it would have been your sin or my sin that would have plunged our world into the brokenness that we now see. You see, your heart and mine, it's no less rebellious than Adam and Eve's was. Now, since then, we've all taken up our own little corner of the world and added our own little flavour to its brokenness. See, when you look around at the state of the world, that should give you an idea of just how bad that sin was and how bad our own sin was, is. Well, well why don't we do that now? Let's look at what the effects of that first sin was. So Adam and Eve, uh, they uh, eat from the tree that was wrong, but you remember that the snake promised them some kind of godlike status, didn't he? We'll be able to yes, and we will. What almighty superpowers will you receive? Eve, you go, girl. What deliciously forbidden abilities will be given to you? Well, let's see how it went. Verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Not sitting in the Hall of Fame, were they? Not the greatest, not the best, but sewing fig leaves to hide themselves. Oh, Adam and Eve, you had it so good. It couldn't have been any better. Now your unbelief and your pride and your stupidity your sin has broken everything you had. So kids, you can guess they're up to the next point now, broken. What have they broken? Well, firstly, the man and the woman. In the last chapter, it ended with their openness and their honesty with each other. Now shame and blame. That relationship's broken. Mankind and creation. In the garden, the ground worked with them. Now it works against them. The very creature, and then the, the snake, the very creature, they're given authority over them. It lies to them and they believe it and they obey it. So that relationship turned on its head, that relationship's broken. The relationship between mankind and their charge, it's broken. The relationship between creatures and their creator, broken. Once there was perfect fellowship and now they hide in shame. 
And then they blame God for it. We've all broken away from God's rule. And so now we're all broken, just like Adam and Eve. And kids, that's, that's our next blank for point three. We have broken away from God's rule, and so now we're broken. Because they break away from God's rule and they refuse to listen to his word, they break away from his blessing also. See, sin breaks our fellowship with God. So Adam and Eve are no longer God's people. If they're not God's people, then they don't belong in God's place. They must leave God's place, the garden. And if they're not God's people, they're not in God's place, not under his rule, they're not under his blessing. And if they're not under his blessing, they're under his curse. We can see that we can either live under his blessing or under his curse, under his approval under his disapproval, under his salvation, under his condemnation. There's no middle ground. You are in God's kingdom or you're not. And right now, Adam and Eve have been banished, passed, cast out of the kingdom. You see, last week we saw the pattern of the kingdom. And kids, if you've got that uh, on the bottom of your sheet that you're working on today, and also on your uh, summary sheet, that's this one, or I'll put it away, it doesn't matter, on that summary sheet that you will have got uh, before, last, last time we saw that the pattern of the kingdom is, is God's people are Adam and Eve, God's place is the Garden of Eden, and God is rules his word, and his blessing is perfect relationships. But now, go to that next one, thanks Emily. But now, in the perished kingdom, so this is the bottom of your sheet now, in the perished kingdom, now perished is another word for broken, but it, the series has to start with P, um, God's people are no one because Adam and Eve, hey, Eve have been banished, that means cast out, banished from the garden. God's people are cursed because they are disobedient. And these next eight chapters of Genesis describe the spread of that sin and its partner, death. That's life outside the garden, folks. Life outside from the rule and the blessing of God and it's ugly. Chapter 4, Adam and Eve's first uh, son kills their second son. Chapter 5, mankind dies and he dies and he dies and he dies. Six, mankind's so evil, six to nine, mankind's so evil that God sends a flood to wipe him out. In God's mercy, uh, he leaves one family as a remnant. But even that family continues the trend. By chapter 11, mankind is staging this reunited revolt against God and they build a tower to congratulate themselves on it. And in judgment and in order to dilute mankind's evil, God spreads mankind across the whole earth. And here we are, generations later, still by nature saying, God, I'm God and you are not. Friends, it is a broken world and we broke it. Uh, I'm going off script here for a second. Uh, it occurred to me it occurred to me uh, as somebody spoke to me in the first service just a few minutes before, and they thanked me for the sermon. I thought, how strange it is that you would thank me for a sermon that tells us of how evil we are. We had just sung the song, uh, Because He Lives, uh, We Can Face Tomorrow. Because He Lives, We Can Face Our Sin. Now, in the series that we're doing at the moment, uh, we will see the big picture of the Bible, but right now, God is the doctor telling us that we've got the cancer. We must know that we've got the cancer unless we won't look for the cure. It is good news that God tells us that we are sinners. It is good news that God gives us this diagnosis because then we will know the cure. We'll know how wonderful the cure is. Now the cure is coming, but right now we're being told you've got cancer. Is there any hope in this passage? It's telling us where our problem is, but is there any hope here? Well, kids are on, uh, are on point four, hope. Now, as we've just said, God's people have been dreadfully evil. They're cast out of God's presence and so out from under his blessing. And as far as this big picture goes, there are no God's people at the moment. 
And friends, that is a terrifying picture. And it could have been the end of the story. Three chapters of the Bible and it's finished. But thankfully it's not the end of the story and it's not the whole picture. Yes, Adam and Eve have been sent from the garden, but God has not abandoned them. Where is the hope in the passage then? Well, it comes to Adam and Eve even in the judgments that God gives them for their sin. And friends, we need this hope. So you might really believe that you're as sinful as the Bible tells you are, tells it to you that you are. You might see that backed up in your own life in the state of the world around you. And if you do believe it, and you should, you're, you're already going to need the hope. You're going to be looking for the hope that's in this passage. A hope that our Creator has not written us off even after such a rebellion. I'm just going to pick out two little, two little whispers of hope, a question and a promise. But it's a promise, it's a promise of hope that speaks clearer and louder as the Bible unfolds. So firstly, the question. Now Adam and Eve have eaten from the tree, they know they've done evil, they know they're naked, and they're hiding from God. Of course God knows what they've done. But what does he do? He seeks them out. Verse 9. And he called to the man and said, Where are you? God called out, where are you? See, God initiates that restoration. He reaches out and he enters the garden. He looks for those rebels. If it was up to them, they'd still be hidden. They broke everything, but only God can restore it. Only he can fix it. And that's the same with your rebellion against him and mine. See, if you're a Christian person here today, you might feel like you found God. Like you went out to look for him. Like you went out to look for him and you found him. But if you're truly someone who has a restored relationship with God, and I hope that you are, you'll know that the opposite is true. He found you. In your natural state, you were running away from him. You were still hiding in the garden. See, there's nothing in your nature that wants anything to do with him. If that makes you angry or if it offends you to hear that by nature you are a God-hater by nature, or well, maybe it is that God hasn't found you yet. It may be that you've never actually admitted to him the extent of your rebellion against him. Well, can I ask you to ask him to show it to you? It's going to come as a shock to know what you're really like by nature. To, to realize that God has to seek you out, even as a sinner. But it's the only path to life, friends. It is your only hope. What's that other whispered hope than we find in the passage? Well, it's that God will restore what we have broken. And kids, can we go back one now? Thanks, Emily. God will restore what we have broken. It says God speaks his judgment on that snake... He says that down through the ages there will be a war between the woman and the snake. But one day, one person in her family will, and at the end of verse 15 now, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. As I said, it's only a whisper of hope, but someday someone will restore what was broken when we believe that snake's lie. And this someone will restore what we have broken. Everything that we have broken, God will restore through this child of Eve. And it's this child, a son, the son, who gives himself up for us, saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you came to restore us. You came to fix what was broken. You sent your own dear son, Jesus Christ, to be broken for us so that we might be restored to you. We thank you in his precious name. Amen.